So I'll put um, both environment and the level of both the environment and the level of involvement is going to define your research, right? Um, the environment is going to define the research, and the more involved you are, the more involved your research will be. Um, which is not to say, conversely, the opposite is true. The less involved, the less the less involved you are, the less sort of relative. Um, relevant, it's, it doesn't hold, right? Definitely the more involved, you know, the more specific your research is going to be, the more precise um, your, your um, uh, outcomes and your assessments will be. Alright? The next is, uh, there are no unifying theoretical frameworks for participatory action research, basically the same. Right? So no unifying Um, and I would put yet. Um, no unifying theoretical frames for participatory action research yet. Um, I am interested in, as a philosopher, all I do is theory. I am interested as a philosopher in looking at potential um, sort of meta-analytical frames for, theor for participatory action research. I'm not going to get into that now. It's not an intro conversation at all. But there aren't any um, unifying theoretical frameworks yet. I think in the next five years that will change. I anticipate that there's going to be some pretty heavy research going on in that area because I'm interested in it and with the people that I've talked about, it seems like, you know, us we Gen X uh, scholars, we're, we, we're, we might be doing something about that. So we'll return to that at another time. Um, Community-based critical reflection is indicative of participatory action research. We know that, right? So it's community-based for the most part. This idea of community is very broad. Community doesn't necessarily mean like a city block. It could be the community of teachers, the community of workers, the community of, you know, whatever. Um, creates a counter-hegemonic narrative. Oh, wow, what does all that mean? A counter-hegemonic narrative, hegemonic just meaning sort of um, solidified power structure, right? So it, it, it's, it's something which seeks to um, break or um, check power power structures, right? It's like a check and balance, right? That's basically all that means. Creates a counter-hegemonic narrative, which means a checks and balance, and suggests, offers, the necessary conditions for change, all of which are necessarily context-specific. What in the world that, does that mean? Basically, you know, I do visuals. So we have um, hegemony, right? So this is, and if I could do that right, H E G, uh, where is it? Uh, King as well. Hegemonic narrative creates a counter, um, creates a counter hegemonic narrative, right? So that's sort of how this would look. G E M O N I C. Right. If this is a hegemonic narrative, what you do in your and, and we recognize that this is um, reinforces right. And that's why I, I try to make it look like a wall, right? So imagine that this is a wall. And you can imagine the wall reinforces boundaries, right? This wall means that I can't go on the other side. The wall contains me. Think of the idea of a wall as the, the sort of the prototypical image for hegemony, right? Hege hegemonic power. So a hegemonic narrative in a Fourierian sense would be the narrative that you, the oppressed, you're not worthy of this. You're not smart enough. You're, you could never teach me anything. How could you? This narrative reinforces an imbalance of power, right? So there's a hegemonic narrative, which just means that you have a very sort of, you have a monolithic, uniformed structure to oppress others. And what happens is you have a community here, and you have your researcher here. Researcher enters the community, becomes the researcher participant, talks with the participants, they become researchers, and they collectively chip away at these blocks, right? So that they chip away at the structure, right? The whole point is to chip away at the structure, to break the structure down. 
right? So then they attack the next block, right? And they move the next block out of the way, right? And they break the structure down. So that's what this is. Researcher enters community, addresses the problems, and chips away at this hegemonic narrative, right? This, this narrative of oppression. Um, and what's so awesome about this, for, for the most part, is, and I'll get into this in a little bit, there are forms of participatory action research which have to do with um, initiating political change, policy changes, so on and so forth. It doesn't have to be that involved. That's a really, really involved, in a technical sense, participatory action research project. You know, changing policy is heavy-duty stuff. Shifting hegemonic narrative is heavy-duty stuff. It's, um, it's, it also has the, the potential to change a lot, right, generationally, right? Once the narrative changes, right, once the narrative that women are oppressive or are oppressed by men and women aren't as intellectually um, uh, capable as men, once that narrative has been proven false, everything changes. It's just a narrative. It's just a story that's being told, right? I'm Nietzschean in the sense. Nietzsche is basically says, whoever tells a better story wins. I mean, that's to wrap up all of Nietzsche. Um, in a gross, gross sense. But um, yeah, what you want to do is you want to see who's telling the story and you want to tell a better story than them. You're telling a story of oppression. I'm the researcher. I, I've, I've spoke, I'm the researcher participant along with everybody here and we have a different story that we're going to tell about ourselves and here's how we're going to sort of wail away at this wall. Um, so uh, that's what all of that means. Creates a counter-hegemonic narrative to suggest the necessary conditions for change, all of which are necessarily context-specific all of that means is identify um, oppressive forces, create a narrative to break down that oppressive force, and tell a new tell a new narrative. And in a freer sense, you can't re put up new like you couldn't you know put up new blocks and become the oppressor, right? You couldn't be oh, whatever. I'm not gonna get into that, but watch freer and you'll understand. Okay, enough of that. All right, so the next um, are eight forms of participatory action research. I'm not going to go through and write this down. Um, I have it in the notes, so if you want to know what the eight forms are, and there's more, but if you want to know what the eight forms are, just uh, print it out uh, and, and follow along. Number one is rapid rural appraisal, and you can imagine what that's about. Um, critical action research, which is pretty interesting, actually. Community-based participatory research. Participatory community research. All of these have variations. I'm not going to get into these now. If you're interested, just you know, uh, copy and paste the, the 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 line, put it into Google or Yahoo, and hit enter, and you'll be able to see the the, the differences between, for example, um, community-based participatory research and participatory uh, community research. Two different types of research: action research, teach action research, which which um, preempted participatory action research, teacher teacher research. Reflective practice research, community service learning research, and so on. So there are uh, eight uh, different forms of participatory action research. Um, the next is the role of participant-generated actions, and this is this is very important, right? So this is the role, the role of the role of participant-generated. The role of participant-generated uh, actions. Collective identification of desired outcomes, right? Collective identification of desired outcomes, right? What we are attempting to attain is an outcome. I want an outcome. This outcome will help in my problem solving. Right? My outcome is going to help in my problem solving, but also my outcome is going to address the problem. Right? My outcome should address, my, address the problem. If the outcome does not address the problem, but addresses something else, then you recognize that somewhere along in your research, your outcome failed because something else failed. Right? My outcome needs to solve the problem. Very, very simple. I mean, this has nothing to do with participatory action research, but you get sort of vague conceptual idea. I want to learn how to bake a cake. So I follow the directions. I do everything that I thought I was supposed to do. And uh, at the close of a half an hour, I open up the oven only to see that my cake is deflated. And then I look at the directions properly and I recognize that I have to use 
um, self-rising yeast or something like that, and I used just regular flour or something. And I recognized, oh, I thought I was following along properly. Now I identified what the problem was in my actions leading to the outcome because my outcome failed. I didn't get what I thought I should have gotten. The question is, why didn't you get what you thought you should have gotten? Because somewhere along the line, prior to the outcome, something in the step failed. This is where critical dialogue and um, collective reflection is important. Right?